All right, so welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Week. Um, on behalf of MSU Denver's Department of Management, Center for Entrepreneurship, I am super pleased to present Nikki Hazemi. Uh, okay, so this is why she's here. So whenever I talk about, whenever somebody comes to me and says they want to start a coffee shop, I always insist that they go to the best coffee shops in town to see what's going on. What are they doing? What are they serving? Why is this the best? Watch the people, listen to the people, see what they're eating, see what they're drinking. So Corner Beat is absolutely hands down my favorite coffee shop in town. Um, I love the vibe. I love the unique people that they have working there. It's one of my favorite. Uh, it just feels really good. The people that show up are my people. Um, their creative food and beverages, what they serve is really unique and feels oddly empowering to me. And so I am so happy that you're here, Nikki. And I'd like you to start yeah. by telling us like how you started your business and what was the problem you were trying to solve in starting your business? One problem. There was many, but, um, so, um, we were just talking about my path of where I grew up and where I moved from. And I was living in a town called Bradley beach, New Jersey. And this is the start of the craze of cold pressed juice that was popping up all along the shore. And I had a friend that would take me to hot yoga and sound bowls. And then we would go get these cold pressed juices and they were all made on a Norwalk juicer. And I kept saying, I'm going to have one of those juicers one day. And um, an old coworker of mine had given me an old little cold press juicer and I would always make juice at home. And I brought that with me when I moved out to Colorado. And when I landed here, I thought, you know, this is the fittest city, but the food options just aren't aligned with all the outdoor activities. Everyone's just eating cliff bars that are filled with crap. Um, you know, the, I, I, this was 11 years ago, so I don't know if anyone remembers what it was like here 11 years ago, but it was very different in terms of what was popping up as far as small businesses. And so when I landed here, I, I said, okay, I need to find a hot yoga studio and I need to find, um, cold pressed juice. Well, I couldn't really find either of those things. And, um, yoga, it, eventually I found my spaces, but cold pressed juice that I think there was one place called the pressery. And so this was always like a nugget in the background of my head while I was, um, looking for a full-time job. I never thought that I would, I never had a vision to be a, a small business owner, really. I mean, it was always one of those things in the back of your head, but, you know, as time progressed and I just wasn't finding this nine to five that I was looking for in traditional setting. And, um, I eventually landed a job with Comcast scheduling commercials. And this was a contract job and I was getting paid $14 an hour to uh, data entry, which is my worst nightmare, um, all day and schedule these commercials. And it was like all live and it was like kind of high pressure, but also like very mundane and very boring. And I just, you can't put me in that kind of container. And so I remember when um, uh, my boss pulled me into her office and said, we'd love to offer you a full-time position. Well, I think my face said no, but I said yes. So later that day, they called me and said, we're going to end your contract because I, it wasn't a direct yes. I said, you know, I, I'd like to think about it. And I think they were looking to hire someone immediately. So they didn't waste any more time with hiring resources. And so they said my contract ended and I was almost like, I was relieved actually. I was like, I, I don't know wh why I would accept that job. I, I just didn't like it. And so my, um, my roommate at the time had a best friend and she was working for a nonprofit and, um, we went to have a, um, I think we went and had coffee and we were just talking about the griefs of like finding a job in this market and like finding something we align with. And she said, I just want to work with my hands. And I was like, you know, there's no cold pressed juice here in Denver. And she's like, what's that? And I was like, well, let me tell you about it. And so she's like, you know, kind of, she got intrigued and I was like, come over to my house there. I have juice in the fridge. And she was like, this is amazing. She was from born and raised in um, California originally. And she was like, I love this. She's like, how do we start? And I was like, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. And so that's pretty much how it started. And so we would just 
um, on my little cold press juicer, like make juices, make recipes. And that's where we figured out how to find out licensing and all of the different things of like starting from point one. Um, I don't know how much time you have to answer this question, but it's a long winded story, but I'll yeah, long. We have an hour. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, okay. So, um, eventually I, um, in a, in a world prior, I did have a full-time job with the County of Wayne in Detroit, Michigan. And I had my little 401k, which wasn't much. Cause I only worked there almost three years. And I think it was like $10,000 is what it amounted to. And once you pay taxes on it, it came out to be 7,000. So that was like the nest egg to start the business. And I was like, we're going to buy that Norwalk juicer. So I bought the Norwalk juicer. Meanwhile, neither of us had any type of working contract with one another, which is something you never do. I don't care how good of friends or family or whatever it is. You always make sure there's something in writing. Um, and then we get the Norwalk. We set it up in her kitchen because it was bigger than more, my apartment. And we just started juicing. And we signed a contract with a commissary kitchen in Longmont to juice overnight. And we said, okay, we'll pop up at music festivals and different markets because at that time, Cherry Creek Market and all the different markets were already filled for the season. This was February. So if like, that's something you're looking for, like you really need to start in the beginning of the year. And like, because applications start and you know, these are popular markets. So we kind of went the alternative route. Where can we find and pop up that is something that's not as traditional that people might want juice. Okay, well, maybe people want to go the, the sober route at little music festivals or, you know, people want an alternative thing to drink. So cold pressed juice it was. Um, at that time, excuse me, I, I was nagging at the same time. And I remember getting a, um, in a message with a woman who was like, yeah, I'm seeking care, it's in town. And I, I, I almost bailed on, on the job interview. I just felt like, oh, just another nanny gig, you know, just like spoiled children in the city. Like this was my thought pattern. And I was like, just go. And so I ended up going and it ended up being the most lovely children I had ever met. And the most lovely, like it was just such an awesome family. Well, it turns out they owned a restaurant group and they were like, well, trade trade us cold pressed juice and exchange to use our commissary kitchen which is now blackbird kitchen and so we were like done so we were like forget driving up to longmont for overnights juicing here's this opportunity and so it just kind of felt like things were like falling into alignment um we started juicing out of that kitchen trading them juice and then popping up wherever we could and then all of a sudden the 420 festival popped up at the um, civic, civic center park. Yeah. And so the guy that was like trying to find vendors, just apparently you weren't supposed to take cash there, but we did. And it was like our first big blowout. And I'll never forget the excitement that came from selling out of all of our juice. Cause we were, we juiced all night to pop up by 10 AM. Like we had two hours of sleep and like set up this tent. We had a crappy Coleman tent, like a shade tent. It wasn't even like a white nice, um, easy up tent. We had a spray painted <laughs> banner that said gypsy juice. Cause that was our name at the time, hand-drawn signs. Like it was complete DIY. And we stood out like a sore thumb at that uh, next to the other vendors that were polished and professional. We, like, we hustled our way into this. And so I was like, okay, like we're gypsy juice. We're going to pop up these juice stations everywhere. This, this feels like most aligned with what we can do. Well, that got exhausting. And so just trying to figure out where do we go next? Do we bottle and manufacture? And we were working with the SBA at the time and we had a mentor and he's like, instead of a business plan, make a roadmap. And so a business roadmap is just, you know, one of those charts, like if we have a food truck, this is the route we can go. And here's the success we want to see. If we get a brick and mortar, here's the route we go. And here's you know, the success we can see, what are your roadblocks? What are some things that are, you know, just expect the unexpected on the way to those paths. So it, it felt more ideal to just get a little brick and mortar that had a little kitchen. So both of us kept like begging our parents. Nobody believed in what we were doing. Nobody wanted to give money. Nobody <laughs> cared to help us. We didn't have loans. We had crappy credit. Like, I mean, we're, 
I was just, I think I was 29 years old and, you know, Donna had restarted her life. So we just weren't in, in a place that we thought that, you know, I mean, entrepreneurs should be right. And it didn't even cross our mind that we're like, we're business owners. It was kind of like, this is a hobby. This is something we hope that takes off. And I realized we started to like kind of gain, gain traction. People were like, oh, you were at that other festival and oh, Gypsy Juice and this is so great. And, you know, we were using all organic produce and it just wasn't something that was happening in the city at the time. So we happened to be at the Nine News Health Fair because remember I, I was like, we were, we're popping up at weird places that we could pop up because all of the, the blocks for everywhere we could pop up was, was uh, booked out. So we're at the Nine News Health Fair and we had um, kale chips and juice and everyone thought the kale chips were weed nuggets and it was just kind of a disaster. It was, it was like f- frustrating, you know, and it's to the point where everyone's asking about it. No one cares that we weren't selling as much juice and um, it was at the Fillmore, which is not too far away from where Corner Beat is now. And this elderly woman walked up to our table. And I remember it was like my last ounce of patience that I had. And she walked up to the table and was like, what's going on here? And I was like, it's juice, you know? And I, it was just like, you you never know who's going to cross your path and you have to always be on when you're in those situations. So I actually think Donna had intervened and she was with this other lady and she was talking to her about the juice. And I'm just thinking like, you're not going to buy a juice lady. And she didn't. However, she said, I have a location up the street. Why don't you come look at it? And we were like, we don't have money for that immediately. We're just like, you know, just right to the, okay, well, like, we'll come look at it. And she's like, yeah, I mean, I, I'm really a, a forgiven kind of landlord, this and that. And we're like, okay, sure. So I remember we went up to my garage, dropped some things off. And we were like, do we go see this crazy ladies? location. And so we did, and it is the now current spot. She was like, listen, I'm going to Thailand. I don't really have um, anyone to take this lease over. We're like, we don't have any money for a down payment. She goes, you can owe me later. Well, if someone says you can owe you later, just always remember that is a terrifying thing and you will owe later. Excuse me. Anyway, long story short, um, we get into this space that has a perfectly built out commercial kitchen and it's kind of a mess from the prior tenants. The prior tenants were the Gypsy House's cafe's brother at the time and he had Hummus Pita Cafe. Well, we came in, put our signs up, Gypsy Juice coming soon. That clashed with Gypsy House Cafe and it was like, we need another name. Like this is just, we need another name here. We're gonna have more to offer here. I mean, it's a big space for just juice, right? Like we didn't have money for an espresso machine. There was one there that wasn't really working. Like I never used an espresso machine before. Like I've never, it's literally someone handed you a business and you were like, okay, now what? Like it was like, we, I had no idea how to use any of the equipment in there, except our juicer. We were like, what's the three part sink for? What is it? Like, it was just like day one of a job that you have no idea and you had to figure it out. So we had a couple of people trial and error food in there and it just wasn't really aligning with what we wanted to do. And my business partner at the time was like, it has to be vegetarian. And I was like, really? And I was like, I just, you know, we, you know, chicken salad, things like that. Like there it's a complete diet. And so that's kind of how the vegetarian um, was born out of there. She's like, we just can't have meat with this beautiful juice. And I was like, all right, we can be plant-based. Like people aren't eating enough vegetables anyway, as it is. So like we can offer that. And so um, I remember we had someone doing these like vegan fritters and blah, blah, blah. And so eventually that didn't work out. And they, it was just kind of like, we're done. And I was like, okay. I was like, I got this. So the next day I made a soup and I was like, let's just have toasts. And I just like threw together some toast ideas. These are things I eat at home. And when I say we were poor, we were very poor. We were barely making rent. And at the time rent was only $500 a month. And so I had a roommate who worked at Oro Wheat and he'd bring home pitas. And I remember putting hummus in there with vegetables. And like, that's how the hill was born out of like, this is, these are things I used to eat at home. And so we, 
I kind of just threw on things that I would eat at home on the menu. And that was, that's just kind of how it started. And so we didn't have a bread vendor. I would go to Whole Foods every morning and pick up bread. We didn't have a lettuce vendor because we didn't have enough demand to order lettuce. Otherwise it would sit there. Um, so I'd have to go to the grocery store every morning, 7 a.m., get all these things together before we opened at eight. Donna would start juicing and we just kind of like flew by the seat of our pants. We had no idea what was going on. And I think like we passed health inspection because we only had a juicer at the time. And um, it just, it was just one of the, it was chaotic. If I had walked into our business in year one, I'd be like, what is this place? And probably would have never have come back. And so, I mean, total bootstrap. We didn't have any extraneous money. Everything was from all of the markets we would do vending. So we'd actually have to close the store to go vend a market to make money to bring it back. And we would have maybe two, $300 days. And to us, that was like enough because it was like, oh, you can worry about rent later. Well, that comes back to get you anyway. But um, yeah, so that was just kind of like, how we started. And that was how corner beat was born into that, that area. And, um, my now business what, partner and I, what, what year was that? What year did you start? That was, um, Gypsy juice was born in 2013, but we had corner beat in 2014. Okay. Um, August 3rd. So we'll be 10 years this year. So oh. that first year was just kind of, yeah, it was, it was a rocky year. Her and I ended up splitting and the landlord was like, well, you owe me money. So someone needs to stay here and operate. And I was like, well, it was always going to be me anyway. So I, and, and to be honest, that was probably the best decision because I could authentically express like my vision and what was happening and what to do there. And then, you know, it just happened that you attract the right people while all of that was happening. And you have people that show up out of the woodwork that, see your vision and want to help and work along with you. And I, like, when I tell you things aligned, like they just aligned, like there was so much kismet that happened throughout the entire experience of all of it. So like, tell us some examples of that, because these are the stories I love. Yeah. yeah. So, um, the landlord where I'm upstairs now, where my office is, um, she had people living up here and she rented it out to a young man who was going to massage school and he was just looking for one bedroom. And, you know, it, this is kind of like dorm style. They're all offices now. And so I remember he came downstairs like the day before Donna left and was like, Hey man, I'm looking for a job. And, and we were like, all right, you know? And so turns out he's an early morning person. Donna left the next day. He came back in in the morning. I don't know why. And I was like, you got a job. I was like, I can only pay you eight bucks cash an hour. And he was like, done. I mean, you know, this is again, nine years ago. So eight bucks cash an hour was decent. You know, he was only there a couple hours in the morning making juice. It was good for him. It was enough for him while he went to massage school. So that aligned. And so in the morning he was making juice and I realized it as far as like replacing a business partner, if all I was replacing was someone to make juice. That's how I knew that the majority of businesses was already on my plate anyway. And so, um, except there's no sweat equity, you have to pay someone now. <laughs> um, so he, he was making juice. And then I think it was like, not even a month had gone by and a table had walked in and it, I, I think we closed at like six or five and this young man and his family came in. Um, well, he was my age. He came in with his family, um, charming, handsome man from Texas. And he was like, y'all aren't hiring, are you? And I was like, you want to work here? Like, why do you want to work here? And I mean, obviously I didn't say that, but they came in 15 minutes before close. And that's like the total eye roll. Right. And it was just me by myself. I'm waiting to go home. All the dishes are done. And I was like, this could be a $45 ticket. Like I need this money. I'm going to make them food. and I'm going to put all of my heart into it. And I did. And so I brought out the food and that's when he asked if we were hiring. And I said, yeah, you can email me a resume. And he emailed me this resume. And it was like, okay. I was like, you don't really have any kitchen experience. And he's like, yeah, but I, I, I'm really good. And I was like, all right, you know what? I don't even care. I was like, I need help. I need another juicer so I can continue to do the kitchen because I didn't know how to teach that. I had no idea. I've never worked in a kitchen like on the line before. I really had no idea what I was doing. And so as we got busier, like there were days where I was like, 
working on that line. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I was just doing it. You know, it was like my food, my creation, my recipes. And I remember like, I never really had recipes written down all the way. I'd always have like one or two ingredients in my head. And everyone's like, you need to write these down. And I was like, yeah, but like, what if someone steals them? And like, you know, there was always that fear too. So like the hummus recipe, I'd always like tweak one or two things. Like if it said two cups, I really knew it was two and a half of olive oil or whatever it was like, like weird things like that. And I don't know why I like felt like I needed to gatekeep those things, but I just did. And so anyway, he came along and he actually elevated the food to make it look presentable, presentable and beautiful. Um, you know, just like fanning the avocado nicely and, um, I, I don't know, just like making the salads look presentable. And I was like, wow. He's like, yeah, I love doing this. He had also never worked in a kitchen and he worked very messy. And so um, I can't hear you somehow. Anyway. Oh, that's good. Cause I, oh, okay. That's yeah. a, oh, okay. And so um, he ended up coming on board and helping and actually taking over the kitchen situation. And, you know, they say like, when always like sometimes when you're working in your business, it's hard to grow your business when you're working within your business. However, like you have to, I think what makes most people successful is if you've worked every role in your business. Mm -hmm. And so the, the one role that I've worked the most has been the dishwasher. I can tell you through and through, because that is the easiest role to pick up and do, and just help out your team. Even if like shit hits the fan in any given day, or you're short a man, it's easier to just, it's easier to just have someone else sometimes be the face of your business because sometimes we hold it's hard not to take things personal. You know, you get up to the counter and people are like, why is this so expensive? Why is this, you know, it's hard to just be objective. And, and, you know, and that's when I realized like, okay, I need to hire a front of house. I'm getting a little burnt out from customers. I'm taking things a little too personal. And, um, and that's how we like slowly started growing. I think, I think I worked, I worked there up until the last um, four years. So the last four years I hadn't had to work there, but I, I'll still jump in and help wherever needed pop, you know, if, if we're short or whatever, but, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm trailing now. So then, yeah, all these people kept walking in and wanted to help align, align and shape the business. And, you know, I always treat it as like, I don't have a business partner to bounce ideas off of. And I remember we had our first manager, her name's Lizzie. She's a lawyer now. And she was like, you should do acai bowls here. And so we did. And that was a huge hit, acai bowl smoothies. And she worked at a place in Hawaii and was able to contribute that. And we went all in with it. However, now it's like, uh, it's not, we don't do acai bowls or smoothies anymore. It's just too much. But um, there's been multiple people that have walked through the doors that have left their mark and um, contributed to the business. And I think that also is what makes you help retain people and be successful if you're like willing to adapt to other ideas and be open to suggestion. Gosh, I love that. Yeah. I love that piece. Because you guys, you guys all, you really do have a nice variety of stuff. And even the drinks you have are a good alternative to um, a standard uh, coffee shop offering, you know, the earth root, tap root, and that kind of blended, um, I don't know, it feels like superfoods that come together in a drink versus just coffee. Yeah. Um, I remember, you know, you have to follow trends a little bit. And I remember superfoods were trending and I was like, we should just start doing superfood lattes. You know, people are shying away from coffee and what if we had other alternatives and, you know, here's, here's some common powders that we can kind of blend together to make, you know, into these yummy drinks. And we just kind of played around and, and birthed those superfoods. That was a long time ago, I feel like now, but we haven't really changed or added too many. I think the the most recent was the mushroom cacao. Oh yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So how many people, this is always what I wonder, you know, when people are trying to do forecasting and try to figure out, you know, what does it look like to have a business? most of the time we don't know how many people are actually working in the environment. You know, you see the person in the front, maybe two people in front. And many. I know how, like at any one shift, say in the, like on a Sunday at 10 in the morning, how many people yeah. are actually working? Yeah. S Saturday and Sunday are our busiest days and Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, square kind of holds your money and then releases it on Monday, Monday, I run payroll. So all of our 
money made on the weekend goes directly to payroll. And so that's just kind of how it's always been. And um, Sunday starts the new week. So that kind of splits it up. But Saturday, Sunday, I would say sometimes there's four in the back and four front of house and then one juicer and one baker. So it could be up to 11. And then in the summer, maybe 12. Okay. Wow. No, sorry, my dog's barking. Wow. Okay. And so um, I'm, I'm glad you said the thing about how you aren't in there actually working anymore because I've never met you and I go in there all the time. Yeah. So I'm sure I did in the early days. But um, so now what do you see yourself what do you see yourself doing most of the time? What do you dedicate yourself to? Paying bills. Right. Um, well, so with, you know, after year five of having Corner Beat came the yoga studio. So there's more than that. There's there's two other businesses and they all piggyback off of each other. So and that's Rooted Heart Yoga, right? Rooted Heart Yoga and Wellness came next. And that was where the love of yoga came in. And um, the salon had left. And I said, this would make a great wellness um, studio. I mean, there's rooms to do. She was doing wax and stuff in those rooms. I said, these could be massage, Reiki, all types of different healings. And, um, you know, just a simple yoga studio. I said, at the time, there was only kindness yoga and then Samadhi. And I was like, you know, why not have like just a little boutique studio here? And so then came the yoga studio and um, simultaneously expanded upstairs while opening the apothecary, which is now going on year two. So they all have this like symbiotic wellness element to, to everything. And um, we're all in the same building. So we go by the Roots Collective now. Um, and so, yeah, ma majority of my day is kind of like low key putting out fires, the ice machines leaking, or, um, what do I do? This happened or, um, so-and-so didn't show up at work today, or we need to hire or, uh, just higher level things that I would say that, you know, I don't really expect to put, um, stress on management. I know that like managing people is enough in itself. And I don't like managing people managing people, like being a manager on the floor where you're having to consistently repeat yourself. It is, it's a, it's a, it's a job that I don't like doing. And I'd rather work with higher level management and manage them instead of like masses of people. So that's, that's one thing that I learned in these, these roles of um, entrepreneurship is that, uh, yeah, managing people is not something I like to do. It's tough. It's really it's tough. very challenging. What about turnover and how has that, how, what is that like for you? Yeah. It seems like maybe it's less because people believe in what you believe in. It seems like they'd stay longer. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm pretty shocked at the fact that, um, our turnover seems far less than in, um, most places. Uh, I think right now, most of our people have most, almost, I'd say 90% of our hires have been there a year or longer. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I feel that uh, what makes that successful is that there's not a lot of micromanagement from me and there's not a lot of micromanagement from their manager. And that there, it's it truly is like a, if there's a squeaky wheel, like it's going to get fixed. And if, it, if there's someone not pulling their weight, everyone kind of naturally votes that person off the island if it's if there's kind of like a bad seed in, in the group and it happens naturally and that person will see themselves out I mean it's rare that we ever have to fire anyone I think they've always just naturally left um if, if they're just not aligned with what we're doing and I think the pay is is well in comparison to a lot of places in the city and um, especially for a small cafe, like we're fast, ca we're fast casual. So it's not like we're table service. Um, and I think most importantly is everyone respects one another that works there and they're all kind of friends and everyone has something unique to offer outside of their day to day. So we have jewelers and artists and people that really are creating something outside of their day to day and they all support one another. And so it's this like, it's like this little incubator there also where I think we attract a lot of small businesses within the small business and creatives that are either want to open their own business someday. And I mean, I've had two leave corner beat um, 
that live in Florida now. And both of them have kind of started their own juice business and they were both juicers. And so I love that. I love to see that. I love to see people that like are, it, when you dedicate so many years to a job, if you can leave there and actually take that experience and apply it to something that you can call your own, I think that is the most valuable thing. So sometimes we work these awful jobs and it's like, if I become a boss one day, that's exactly how I'm not going to be. And that was the last job I left before all of this started. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so when you talk about your other businesses, like these other people in you that work for you that also have other businesses. So I know you guys have like a little, I've been to a market in your wellness area, like market of all these like little businesses mm-hmm. is are most of those people that work for you that showed up at that market to sell. Um, there's a few, there's a few, like one or two, but not really. Some of them are just aren't prepared on that level to sell things, but a lot of them are people we do work with within the apothecary and have just been, you know, have had their art on the walls or just our everyday fans of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay. So now do you, so you were talking about trending, um, acai bowls trending or earth root, you know, like, um, uh, superfoods trending. Would, do you actively seek out this idea? Do you go to trade shows and read trade journals and stuff to get no. the information? Or are you just like, I keep hearing it's, about it. It's all intuitive. Um, it's just kind of, you know, I, social media is going to show you, I mean, it's the people that go to trade shows are, are, I think on a higher level of, of manufacturing and, and things like that. I mean, I just, I don't like trade shows. <laughs> <laughs> they're just not really my scene. And I, I just, you, you also have to adapt to like your neighborhood and your, your clientele and your customer base. Like what, what do people want in this neighborhood? Um, and one of the things is the evening program. We tried to do cocktails cause we thought everyone was like, this place should be open late. So we, you know, spent a lot of time like creating these like craft cocktails and really doing the like the most in order to create syrups and recipes and things. And it just didn't take off like I thought it would. And that was a fail. And that was hard to, it's a tough pill to swallow, but you know, my uncle always taught me like, you don't fail, you fail forward. And I said, okay, like, what did we learn from this experience? Most people came in, they wanted food and what kind of food did they want? They wanted our everyday run of the mill menu later. So we pivoted and adjusted our hours to stay open until 9 p.m. We have games and we have natural wines and things that are more aligned with what we're doing. So it's almost like, okay, like if craft cocktails are trending right now and so are NAs, well, what's trending in your neighborhood? Because those are the people that are supporting you. Hmm. So it, it's one of those like kind of read the room situations. So it, trends don't always work, I guess. Oh, yeah, I love that. I do yeah. remember that cocktails, the cocktails. Yeah because it was really clever. Yeah. Um, okay. So how would you say, these are kind of general questions, like tell me how you motivate your people, your staff. Um, well, since I'm, I'm not really hands-on as much at corner beat anymore, I would say that I definitely, um, try to empower as much as possible instead of like motivate. So it's, um, you know, anyone can dangle money over someone's head and that's always motivating, but what else is motivating? Hey, here's come up with a, come up with a special, come up with a soup. Here's, um, have the freedom to order the ingredients you want to make something that you love to put on the menu or, um, make a special. What are some, uh, coffee drinks or something that you want to see as a special what is something you can creatively think of like our baker he has complete freedom to do whatever he wants he comes in what he wants he ha- like he's it's just he, you give people autonomy with guidelines and you know have um i guess that is their finding their intrinsic motivation i guess is yeah. is is what is i think key to success with motivation, right? Yeah. I love that. Really good. Yeah. Cause then you get, yeah. then you get people's, uh, real, I don't know, like test out creative ideas that can then either become a bigger part of the menu or just be an occasional thing that pops up. Yeah. Or, 
hey, I worked it like just also allowing for the space to say, there's another, there's a better way to do this. And it's like, okay, well, let's execute it and see. And we'll let you know, like, if you see a better way of how to cut a vegetable or whatever it is, I mean, obviously there's a million ways to, to do certain things, but sometimes it's just like, you get so used to doing the same thing. And then you have a new hire come in and they're like, why do we do it this way? And it's like, I don't know, we've always done it this way. And they're like, well, I've learned this. And I think it's just like being flexible and open to understanding that other people have other experiences from other places that can like make things better, you know? And I always say like, how can I make your job easier? Like, do you need an anti-fatigue mat? What do you need? Like, do you need special gloves? Like what, like, what is it? Do you have a special spatula you love to use all the time? Like little things like that, that are like not high level purchases to make people's job easier. Like sometimes I like see things with like duct tape on them and I'm like, what do you, and I, I appreciate the taking the longevity of, of things, but I'm like, if we need a new pot, just say so. Like there. We don't have a huge budget, but we can get you a new pot, you know, things like that, where I, it, it's, you know, how, how to always like make the work environment feel like a safe place to come forward with things that are, you know, that could be better. Mm, yeah. It's like, you're allowing people to co-create with you, which is really yes. cool. 100%. Love that. Okay. So tell me what, tell us about some of your biggest challenges. You've mentioned a couple of what, when you think, oh my God, these are the biggest challenges. What would you say they are? Honestly, the biggest challenge is um, maintaining the payroll. It is very high and you need all of those people to do all of those jobs, if not more, to deliver a quality experience and um, have quality food behind what you're doing. And, you know, with, so the pay structure works as follows, like um, in a restaurant, only, only $3 can account for the difference of minimum wage. And so that means everyone starts at 1529 plus tips and tips average between eight and $10 an hour. So um, not only are you paying taxes on the tips, it's um, the hourly has gone up and the, the restaurants themselves, this is like a part that people don't understand. Well, if you can't afford to pay your staff, you shouldn't be in business. Well, the structure of restaurants have always been a small margin. And I mean, you're lucky if you're taking home 20% of your earnings at the end of the year, um, if not owing. Um, and so I think part of that is just how do we change the script or change the model of restaurants? Because a long time ago, it used to be, oh, I make $3 an hour, but I live off tips. Well, now everyone is, there's always a tip screen in front of me. And they don't understand that like without the tips and we have 18% built in, or we have, sorry, we have 15% built in or 16 that without that, we wouldn't exist as a business. If I had to pay everyone out of pocket, $26, 24 to $26 an hour, we would have been bankrupt a long time ago. And I think that is the biggest challenge of just having people understand that it is a luxury now to go out to eat and that we are you know, we're not a essential business. We're, we're a luxury. If you can go out and afford a $7 coffee, like this is, this is what it is. And I, you know, it's hard not to take those comments, um, to heart because it's like, wow, if I could pay even more, I would pay minimum wage plus, plus tips, you know, where people are making close to $30 an hour, because how is anyone surviving at 18, 29 an hour? I have no idea. You know, and so I think definitely payroll is like the biggest challenge where you always want to make sure people feel adequately compensated alongside of, you know, just like being able to afford their like way of life and living in Denver, especially in Denver. Well, and everyone lives in Capitol Hill. So, yeah, and it's just it's not cheap. Mm hmm. All right. So hell, I mean, you've mentioned a couple of these, uh, two, like times that you've pivoted. What are the great, biggest times where you were like, Oh, shift. Oh, shift. Yeah. It's usually when things just aren't working, you know, um, it's always being able to adjust. Like if, a, if certain ingredients, the prices on certain ingredients are through the roof, like acai bowls and, and, and smoothies, like the ingredients were costing so much money and there was so much work behind the scenes and we were just doing so much for 
And it's like, unless we wanted to see a profit on these smoothies, we'd have to start charging $16 a smoothie. And there's just, you know, the, the time and effort to do the acai bowls, which are a huge hit and they just contributed to our sales. It's like, it just doesn't make sense for us to keep doing this. It's insanity. Like the, they were loud, the blenders, like they drove me nuts. And eventually it was just like a sigh of relief to get rid of them. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of like, let somebody else like, um, rush bowls or whatever it is that's in the city. Like if that's their sole thing to do, like they can do that. Like we are plant-based healthy food. Like we can stick to that. And you know, it, someone else can do smoothies. It was just, it just felt like it was taking away too much from the staff was complaining about it. And I'm not going to force people to do things. And it was like a continuous thing. It was always like, Oh, smoothie bowls, smooth, you know, smoothies. It just, it felt like a lot. So it was like, let's just get rid of them. Let's just stop. Yeah. Customers are going to gripe about it, but also like, you're not the ones back here. Make, make an, you can make a smooth, go to whole foods then and get your smoothie. Like I, you know, so it's just being able to see what's working for your team and your, your, yourself and, and your margins mm -hmm. and changing. And now when, how often do you change up the menu? You know, I try to do it seasonally and, you know, like usually twice a year. Okay. And sometimes we'll like just change things or people like, we just went back to the mushroom Havarti panini, which is just like a simple, like mushroom grilled cheese. But it was like, we tried to do something else and everyone was just like, are you going to bring that back? And it's also like, I think it tastes better. So I'm like, let's just bring it back now. Little things like that, that just are easier to prep more cross utilization of ingredients. And um, yeah. Yeah. Talk about that cross utilization of ingredients. I love that idea. Yeah. I, most restaurants do this. If you notice that, okay, if something like asparagus is in season, you're going to see it in three different dishes, you know, um, just making sure that, you know, you're using, if you have a pickled red onion, that you're using it in more than one thing than just one item. Like why are you spending all the time to prep and have one ingredient for one dish? And so that's something to look at. So, you know, time is money. So if someone's going to be prepping the mushrooms and onions, for example, we can use them in the grilled cheese. We can use them in the Benedicts on the weekends. We can use them on um, the avocado toast so that they're cross utilized. So when they're prepped, it's not just for one thing. Mm -hmm. So it's using time wisely. Wow. Okay. So tell us about like, what's next for you? Where do you see yourself going in the next, like, I don't know, year, five years, 10 years. What do you think? Oh, I thought it was an early retirement, but the way the restaurant scenes are going, I just don't, it, it feels exhausting. Coming up on year 10, I'm, it, it feels tiring because, you know, you have a manager that works one to two years and then you have to get someone new. And there's, there's definitely a turnover for management in the restaurant industry. And that's just standard. Um, I, I, I ultimately would like to um, purchase this building um, from the landlord. She wants to retire. And that seems like the next best step. I don't know if there is a second location for me. I did sell licensing to the corner beat to someone that tried to do it in Cherry Creek and just really did not succeed with it at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that that franchise was the, if they were going to continue to franchise it, I thought that that was the meal ticket. <laughs> but um, the truth is restaurants are, we're always operating off a loan. You take out a loan, you use it to help boost your, you know, your day to day and you pay it off and then you take out another one and you pay it off and you take, and it's, I was so embarrassed about that um, in, in the beginning until I realized like, there's no way restaurants are surviving off of, if you don't have some type of debt. I just did, our economy is just not, it's just not built for it. And, um, you know, it pays me a very modest salary, but there's no, at the end of the year, we made $10,000. Like there's no chunk of change you take at the end of the year. It's usually like, yikes. <laughs> at least you're not under, but sometimes maybe you are like the whole COVID year must've been awful. No, actually COVID year, we were not under because of um, the PPP was helpful mm -hmm. and um, you had less staff to pay and 
actually the takeout model was extremely lucrative. If you could own, yeah, I mean, you weren't, you didn't have to have a dishwasher. Um, yes, we were paying more for paper goods, but you know, the economy was still decent during COVID. If you think about it, we hadn't quite hit that inflation. So you could have fewer, it was just the, you could basically do takeout and, and have four people working, which was me. I was, I was back to work as one of those people. It was like me and three other people. And we did that for like four months. And, you know, it was just like, it was financially lucrative to have less staff because we were catering to less people in the restaurant, if that makes sense. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. Excellent. Okay. Does anybody have, um, I, if you have any questions, put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and I'll continue to ask some more questions while you're coming up with your questions. Um, I'm, um, what would you say, what would be advice you would give people when starting a restaurant? What would your advice be for them? Now? Don't do it. No, just kidding. Don't. <laughs> oh, I, I, I would make sure you really have something unique to offer something that is unique, but also simple, if that makes sense. Um, somebody once asked me, what are the things that, you know, wh why are, why is your food so good? And I said, well, a lot of it is just basic, basic ingredients just made well. These are things that, um, like the dressings are all house made, but there's like five max ingredients in them. And they're just things that just are done well, or the traditional, we have a lot of, um, my family's from Lebanon. We have a lot of like Lebanese influenced foods on the menu. And those are foods that have been served for thousands of years. So why would they be, and they're simple ingredients, you know? So why would, it's just, I don't know. I can't explain it, but it's just simple done well, but which is a unique offering. You know, there aren't 10,000 different things going in to make a menu item. It's just like, here's a like delicious, beautiful filling salad with, you know, simple ingredients that is done well and it's clean eating, but it's unique to Denver, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so tell us something that we would surprise us about your business. What are some of the things, what things would you say would actually surprise us about corner beat or the, the whole thing root collective? Yeah. <laughs> um, we are pretty much a zero waste restaurant. Um, the only, I, I mean, we even utilize tomato butts to make, um, uh, either those go in, I don't know if it's the green chili, but we'll save a lot of those in the summer and make soups or use the ends to um, make like salsas or things like hot sauces, things like that. So even like the ends of the tomatoes that are cut off that are presentable for a toast, those get utilized. I would say the most amount of waste that we have are just like the slivers of the bread ends. And even those get eaten. Staff will take a bag home and take the bread ends home or whatever. Um, we are very, very zero waste. Oh, that is amazing. I yeah. also think that you guys do this, um, uh, this kind of uh, rotating hot sauce, probably based on oh, what yeah. is available. And I, that's my, one of my favorite things, like every that's time like a, different. that started randomly with, um, staff one day just making hot sauce. I think Will might've started it. And then everyone was like, I'll make the hot sauce. And it just changes. And it is one of those like underground things that only people know, like, okay, the, the hot sauce is rotating here. And if you want house made hot sauce, it's always going to be different from week to week. And especially in the summer, when we have more fruits that are in season, you'll see, like, I think for a while we had dragon fruit, hot sauce and um, just really unique things. And that's where the staff gets excited. Like I'll make the hot sauce this week and they can do whatever it is that they want. It's so good. And uh, that's the thing. It's funny how you try to have to the, like the idea of having your food super consistent is important. Like, I know that's what you go for that. It, yeah. You create a recipe and that can follow it so that people can count on something, but it is kind of fun because you kind of don't know what you're going to get with it. Yeah. But, and, and so that's cool. Yeah. It, I feel the thing that makes a, a restaurant successful is consistency. Even if you're consistently mediocre, you know, I'm going to go here and always get 
this and it's always going to taste like this whatever restaurant it is it's just like okay it's like mediocre but it's good and it's just like consistent you know uh-huh yeah, yeah. and then and that's a when- challenge if you have right, and then you throw in specials and, you know, things that make it interesting also, you know, it's good that are different every time you go in. So kind of a good combination of, of those things, but you also know they're going to be good no matter what you get. Yeah. That's good too. Hey, okay, so, time. yeah, well, I haven't had one that wasn't good. Have you guys, has anybody ever made a salsa and you're like, Ooh, yuck. I, I mean, t- it's so subjective. I mean, there are things where I've like tried the soups and I'm like, yuck, not for me, but people like that soup was so good. And I'm like, you know, it's, it's all about everyone's different palate. Mm -hmm, For sure. Mm -hmm. Hey, so Hillary's asking, what's the best way to handle typical customers in the restaurant business? Ugh, 86. um, (laughs) Have you had to do that? A couple of times. So one thing we do not tolerate is um, people being rude to staff. And I've definitely told people you can leave and not come back. We don't treat human beings that way. And this, this is not tolerated here. And I think, I think it's changed where the customer isn't always right. And um, if we're, if we're being rude, I mean, Basically, at the end of the day, people are going to complain, right? But the last thing we want them to do is to go online and leave a nasty review. And I am guilty of responding very sarcastically and awful to some of those reviews where people, you know, and someone was like, you know, there's a better way to handle that. And I was like, these people are just complaining about things. There was nowhere to sit one star. Like, what do you want me to do about that? Expand my restaurant for you? Um, So, you know, you're always going to have you're going to always have your complainers, but then you're going to have your repeat customer base. And the ones that are your repeat customer base aren't the ones always leaving a review. They're just coming back. Or you have the people that are like, yeah, it sucked. I'm not going back. And that's okay. But as far as like difficult customers in the restaurant, it's like, we can offer you a refund. Um, What else do you want? And some people just want to be heard and some people just want to complain. And so I think it's just all in how you handle it. Um, but if they're actively being rude or, you know, directly to, to, to a staff member, it's like, you, you need to leave. There's nothing we can do here for you. Um, send us an email. I, you know, and it's just a lot of people just, you know, just give them their refund and send them on their way. And, you know, you can refuse service to anyone in the state of Colorado, like we're so, and if, if somebody is consistently coming in you know, and being a toxic customer, like you don't have to serve them. You don't, it's, it's unfair to your staff. Right. And that's happened, huh? It it has happened a couple of times. And I feel like the staff always feels good when you have their back, you know, like no one, like everyone needs to go work in the service industry for a period of time. I think like a max of two months, like you have to, I think it should be like a, a requirement in high school just to learn. Like it, these aren't easy jobs, you know, and we're still humans behind the business. We're small business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so true. It's one of the hardest jobs. I'm always so grateful for those people working at my favorite yeah. restaurants. If they weren't there. Yeah. I wouldn't get to go. And that makes me sad. So I'm grateful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause people don't usually stay in that business very long. You know, it's a, a thing they do when they're in high school or getting through college or whatever, cause they have flexibility, but then oh. you know, people usually have something beyond that, that they want to do. So I appreciate those people Yeah. as a, as like a person that owns it, you're dealing with these people that are constantly, you know, gaining and then leaving, gaining and leaving, like learning and then going. And that's part of what it means to be in a restaurant. I'd imagine. Yeah. And some people are like, I can't handle customers anymore. Can I try back a house? And we're like, sure. And then you realize like back a house is nonstop all day. I mean, they don't sit down nearly as much. I mean, it's, it's, it's on a weekend, it's busy. Oh yeah. It's so busy. Yeah. And it's nonstop. Yeah. Okay. So Brandon is asking, do you leverage social media for marketing and advertising? Absolutely. Um, We have um, a, a lucrative, uh, position now is hiring a social media manager and having somebody stay on top of trending reels and, um, you know, whatever it is, uh, posts and, you know, hashtags now, no hashtags, um, sponsoring ads. Um, you know, you always have to be relative and I mean, people want the demand in their face now, now, now we want to see like, what are the specials today? Like, I mean, people even go as far as 
sending messages. Are you hiring? And I don't respond to those. If you're that lazy, you can't seek out an email. I'm not responding. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, and Facebook is not so much anymore. It's definitely Instagram. We tried the TikTok thing and I just, it got a little annoying to me. I mean, maybe because I'm, I'm an elder millennial, it just didn't feel that it was relative to us. I think we still have one that's active. It just definitely Instagram. Yeah. Sure. You really only have to have one, you know, you yeah. can do well on one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, absolutely. You have to leverage that. People want to see what's going on behind the scenes. I love that. Hey, okay. So um, Nathan is asking what kept you going through the early and tough years of your business? Oh, a will to never have a boss ever again. <laughs> uh, truthfully, um, I always say this, if somebody um oh and did you have a backup plan okay so if somebody would have showed showed me the tough tunnel of like the four years of really getting on my feet and they were like this is everything you're going to endure um I would have sat back looked at that tunnel and been like absolutely not I'm good that's hard but when you're in it you're in it and there's just this like focus and it was you know waking up at 4 30 a.m to be there at six and washing the last dish and going home you're not home till eight and it's just these long grueling days and that's if you don't have capital and you have to work in your business from morning until night and looking back would i be able to handle those days now absolutely not there's no i'm not ever getting up before 6 a.m unless i absolutely have to and it's to catch a flight somewhere tropical um <laughs> but truly i you know if somebody would have showed me like And then uh, we used to do open mic. We still do open mic, but it used to be on Thursdays. And those are my longest days. I wouldn't get home till midnight. And I would like beg someone, can someone please open the next day? I'll come in at eight. Like that was like a little bit of window of sleeping in. And I just remember like my fingers were cracked and it was just nonstop, like washing dishes and cooking and cleaning and doing all these things. And it was a lot. And I don't know that I would have that motivation anymore now, but I feel like I've put in my time, I've done my work, you know, and you just, it, it, I don't know, M- money is a motivator and just like what is on the other side and you just don't stop, you know, and when you're in it, you're in it. But again, if I was looking through that tunnel, I was like, oh, that's a lot of work. I don't know if I want to do all that for four years in a row, but it goes by fast mm-hmm. and you come out the other side, either successful or not. And you know, I finally hit that period of feeling truly successful in 2019 and then COVID happened. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, and everything after COVID has just felt like exhausting, you know, because of inflation. Oh yeah. It's huge. It's huge. Yeah. And like you said, people will pay what, what you're charging though. I mean, they obviously do, they do because the lines out the door half the time. And so, you know, and I am, I, you're also getting quality food. I mean, even I I think fast food is ridiculously priced now too. I mean, I hear people complain about like a value meal being like 13, $14. And I'm like, oh, you can get an organic salad for 15, you know? Um, And it's to the point where, yeah, prices are going to have to raise again. And even if I, sometimes I'll open up my Uber eats app and just like load up certain carts from restaurants and just see, and I'm like, wow, 20 bucks for an 18 inch pizza. Like that's a lot of money. You know, this is bread, dough and cheese, but again, it's like cost of living. It's our rents have gone up. It's, you know, goods have gone up 30%, 40%. Flowers doubled in price. Sugar's doubled in price. Like little things like that, that are still don't look like high value items, but it's like when everything is just increasing, you're like, wow, you know, How long did you, did you start off doing all your own books and do you still do your own books? Back to, if I had a backup plan though, I did not. I always knew I could fall back on my education if I needed to, but there wasn't an option for a backup plan. There was just, if you're, if you're willing to succeed, you will succeed. So that's, that's my two cents. Um, Books. No, they were a wreck and it's hard to work in your business and do your own books. Um, I have a bookkeeper now and, um, I've had a couple different ones that have just, they've, my books have always been organized. 
I'm, I'm a really bad business owner in the sense that I don't really look at my P and L's as often as I should, because I know where the drain is. It's cost of goods and payroll. You know, those are things I can't really change, but I can go in and dig around and look at certain invoices and say, Oh, wow. Beets are really high this week. Um, let's make less beet juice or, um, maybe there's another source for roasted peanuts out there. This feels like a lot per pound, you know, and it's always just reevaluating those things because it changes so often when you're working with fresh ingredients and, you know, higher end stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, but I definitely, I was flying by the seat of my pants until I found my CPA. Um, yeah. how long did it, what, what, at what stage was that when you hired somebody to do that work? Um, probably year three. Okay. I think I've had Kelly now. Yeah. That long. Um, but I didn't even have like real payroll. I don't know if I should speak about this. I mean, everyone was kind of paid cash like for the first three years. I didn't know what to do. Like I didn't, you don't know is the truth. You like, don't know. And you really don't. Telling you. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, like I have the cash from the week. Like this is how I paid people out by the day cash, you know? And it was just like, it was less of a big deal then than it is now. And when you have one or two people coming in and out, it's just kind of like, here you go. What are you going to do? Mm-hmm. You're still operating at a loss anyway. So, <laughs> Hey, so talk <laughs> about the seven years. They can't audit me anyway now for those years. Oh, so. good. Phew. oh, that's good. But it is interesting because you don't know what you don't know until it's time to know it or until it becomes part of what you know. Yeah. And, and- the CPA was finally like, you need a payroll. There's too many people in here. You can't track this cash. There's a lot going to the bank that should be going. That, and I'm like, okay. And that was like the next big step, right? It was like, okay, like we have a full payroll. And I feel like taking that jump into having a payroll was like a leap of growth, you know? And so it's like, okay, it's just, I don't know. It might sound uh woohoo, but like, it's telling the universe like, no, okay. This is like the next big thing. I'm ready for this. I'm ready for a big staff. And then you grow, you know, and it's just not being afraid to like make those decisions. I love that. Hey, so talk about how, um, I know you've got a master's in, in what industrial organization. Yeah. Okay. And talk about how that has actually played into your success. If it has, um, I don't really know. I don't really, I, I hate to um, discredit institution and schooling, but your, your best life experiences are not, you're, the things you learn in college are not going to be applied in, into a lot of the stuff that you're doing. You know, it's your experiences outside of the classroom, your internships, your um, businesses that you decide to study. So Um, I remember having to do, um, I remember I did, I took my mom's salon that she was working with and I gave everyone, um, an assessment test about the culture and the organization. And it was not anything that my mom didn't already communicate about the business that I could like see based on the little chart and stuff like that from assessing it. But I I don't, I don't know that a ton of things that I had learned are applied now. You don't remember that, you know, by the time I, (laughs) By the time I got here, I'm like, I don't know. I know that's not what institutions want to hear, but. No, but you know, this is why Metro is a great school because it's expensive and it feels like we are dealing with more real, real things rather than high tech, high growth. And this is what my best experience was in community college. I learned the most there and I learned the most because of I don't, my teachers were most passionate about teaching there than I ever thought, thought, saw through majority of my time through grad school. I feel like that my colleagues, everybody just cares so much about being here yeah. and sharing what they know. Yeah. Not so theoretical. Like I appreciate the fact that it's not very theoretical. It's more like, this is what, this is what you need to know. <laughs> yeah. You can just leave the rest. Cause you're right. What you, what you learn in school like even if you learn this batch of information it applies differently to every scenario you ever find yourself in yeah so, you know you prepare yourself by maybe taking yourself through the process of whatever it is you're engaging in it's the process you're learning and then you can apply that process when you get out There's, there was a couple cl- like couple classes that like left little nuggets in your brain like you know the emotional intelligence course and like really understanding you know 
it, more like sociology, like groups of people and trends and things that you found really interesting, you kind of like hold on and retain and remember like, okay, when we're dealing with, like, if we want to shift the culture of, of our organization or what's happening, like, how do we do that? And those are things that you remember and like shifting culture takes time, you know, and it just doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, there, it is what it is. And I hate that expression, but there are things that will just always continuously be in your business and you really have to pick and choose your battles. Mm -hmm. I love that. Excellent. Anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. I have. Okay. You, you can raise your hand too, if you don't want to type it in. Okay. Well, Nikki, thank you so much. I can't believe it. All these years yeah. I've, been, I've never met you. So <laughs> it's a great honor. Thanks and for having me. I appreciate it. I just appreciate it so much.